Uh, I'm Mike Manetsky. I'm the Director of Technology at Four Kitchens, as you might tell from my uh, jacket. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about our experiences working with GraphQL and JSON API uh, in the wild. Um, so uh, here's the agenda. Here's what I'm trying to going to try to get into. So talk a little bit about uh, background and some info about us. Um, a little bit um, about um, what JSON API and GraphQL are. I can tell from the amount of people that I kind of know here that that's probably not going to be the most important section for everyone here. Um, but I bet there's at least one person here who could really uh, use it. And then also kind of helps frame some of the other stuff I'm going to talk about. Uh, then I'm going to dive into a little bit about what um, uh, what we built uh, with one of our clients, um, and then pros and cons of each approach and what they bring to the table. Um, I'm sure that it's going to be at least a little bit controversial, um, so I'm kind of curious, like, like who here is like Team JSON API? Mm. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and who who's Team GraphQL? Okay. All right. Uh, let's let's get started then. Um, so, who am I? Uh, so, I'm uh, Mike Manetsky, Director of Technology for Kitchens. Uh, you can find me as Mirzu on most things. Um, if, you're, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't work, just start adding use and it will eventually. Um, who's for Kitchens? Um, so, for Kitchens, um, we're a digital agency that creates websites, apps, and software um, for organizations that need to tell important stories. Um, We've uh, been in business for about 13 years. Uh, we've served sophisticated clientele as their trusted digital partner to realize and exceed their goals. Uh, Four Kitchens web chefs believe that creating a website is like preparing a feast. It requires a team of people with specialized and complementary skills working together in concert to create something that lots of people will enjoy. It's part art, part science, and it's all about preparation. Um, and we're going to be talking about the work that we've done with uh, NBC. Um, so uh, we have been uh, we've been working with them for uh, as about as long as I've been at Four Kitchens, so about six years. Um, and over that time, we've um, evolved API solutions um, that started out as a. Um, a uh, specific solution for one show um, developed uh, on Drupal 7 um, and uh, ended up uh, today powering um, all of their apps, devices, um, and UI experiences. Um, so for if it's on Roku or if it's an uh, uh, app on a uh, Fuji TV, um, it's powered by our API. Um, and I'll, I'll hit these numbers again later, uh, but there are terabytes of data um, so that's not like video files or anything like that, but just terabytes of just metadata about uh, the the shows and movies that we're hosting. Um, there's tens of millions of requests weekly, um, and uh, we're very proud of the fact that the um, API uh, provides personalized content um, in uh, at um, uh, in sub uh, uh, half second um, uh, response times. Um, so that means that like if you're your favorites um, or uh, you're recently watched those kinds of things um, so uh, when I say we we is a little bit bigger than just four kitchens um, in a lot of the things that we've built um, so we work very closely with um, uh, the NBC internal team um, and um, they have also worked with um, Lullabot as a um, uh, as an agency partner um, so we is a little bit bigger than Four Kitchens, and I'm happy to sort of, uh, if anybody has any questions about like what are the specific things we built, um, but kind of talking about this as a solution, um, just easier to say we. Um, so so why why did I put this uh, this talk together? Because um, I like controversial topics. Um, no, it, it's uh, so there's there's a lot of theory um, and there's a lot of um, uh, people talking about preferences and things like that. Um, but uh, there weren't enough case studies, uh, and certainly not enough case studies comparing the two. Um, so you can find case studies of how wildly successful JSON API was for somebody, or how wildly successful uh, GraphQL was for somebody, uh, but not necessarily um, you know, sort of something that really compares both in the wild. Um, so yeah, so so first um, let's let, let's talk about you know what these things are um, and how they kind of like relate to the work that we've done. Um, so really kind of just want to 
level set for, for, for three big terms. Um, so one of them is rest, um, which in short is it's a set of constraints that uh, if applied to an, uh, uh, an, an architecture, like result in these uh, desirable properties of that architecture. I'll expand on that in a second. So JSON API, it's a spe specification for formatting um, uh, uh, REST API responses um, in JSON. Um, and GraphQL, it's a little bit different um, than JSON API um, because it's a query language for APIs. Um, and it's a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. Um, and that's an important distinction. So it's um, uh, there the, the, the line as to like where JSON API stops um, and where GraphQL stops is different on the back end because of that runtime. So REST. Um, like I said, uh, it's a set of constraints that result in a set of properties. So representational state protocol. Uh, it's a software architecture style that defines a set of constraints um, to be used uh, for creating web services. Um, six guiding uh, constraints define a RESTful system, um, and these constraints restrict the ways which the server can process and respond to client requests. So that um, by operating within those restraints, the system gains desirable non-functional properties, such as performance, scalability, simplicity, uh, etc. Um, it cannot be considered restful um, if the system violates uh, any of the required constraints. Um, so that's like from Wikipedia. But it's a pretty good explanation of it. And I think there's like important parts to, 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 to what it's talking about. So like first of all, um, it's, it's a set of constraints, so it's a, it's, a, it's a set of limitations that you're putting on the architecture. Um, that if applied properly, you're going to get these good things. So if you do client, if you um, if you uh, check off all the boxes on the left hand side, you're going to get the stuff on the right hand side. And if it violates those uh, constraints, it can't be considered restful, and you're not going to get the stuff. You're not going to get the good stuff. Um, so it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's abstract, but it's also kind of rigid. Um, and it's true, um, uh, and that's one of the things that we've definitely experienced, is that it's like so-called REST, and, and, and everybody here has probably had an experience, right? Like where it's like working with a, like a so-called REST API is a lot worse than not having an API or something, all right? I mean, it's just, it's just awful. Um, so like, if it's done right, you're going to get all these benefits. Um, and a, a couple of things that um, kind of came up in, in, in some of the research that I, uh, uh, that I'll, I'll, uh, that I did for this talk uh, um, that really resonated with me is like, first of all, REST is really, really rare. Like, there are lots of kind of REST APIs, but very few real REST APIs. And that kind of tells you something. Um, and um, it also takes um, a high level of, uh, a high depth of understanding um, and a lot of discipline to get it right. So JSON API um, is a specification that sits on top of REST um, and uh, specifies uh, how the responses um, in a RESTful um, API should be formatted um, so that uh, different things that use the same spec specification can be um, uh, interoperable. Um, what it specifically um, uh, what it specifically specifies is like um, how um, uh, how clients should request um, uh, uh, data, how the responses from the server should be formatted, um, and how to uh, edit that data. So here's a quick example of like what a, um, uh, a get request to slash articles um, will, will, you, you'll get from uh, JSON API. Um, so it's the yeah. first thing you see are, is the type and the ID. Um, the attributes, like this is a simplified example, of course, like that's probably like would in most cases be um, a, a fairly large collection of different attributes, including a body, um, including the, um, uh, the categories, et cetera. 
Um, and then um, it has an, a, a, this important concept of links um, and relationships. Um, and those are expressed um, both, um, like it, it relates back to itself, but then it also has a link here um, to an author. So if you requested an article, um, you would actually, you could also get back the, um, uh, you would, you would, you, you, it, it tells you how to find um, the author. So it tells you, go, go to this um, uh, other URL if you want the, the author for this specific article. Um, it, uh, uh, it, it also has a, a, a like some uh, sugar, I guess is a, is a good way of putting it, um, or additional features um, uh, that are optional, um, but really um, tackle some of the like potential pitfalls um, of a REST API. Um, so one of them is um, the, the opportunity to uh, include uh, documents together in the same response. Um, so in this example, instead of just getting the, um, the articles, um, you get uh, the articles and the authors. Um, the other is that you can limit, um, and so when you have a re response like that for, for um, it, that includes like a, a post and all of its, um, uh, and, it, and everything about the author, that can be a really heavy response. Um, so you can actually, it gives you an opportunity to limit what those responses are. So instead of getting everything, including like the taxonomy and all that kind of stuff, you can just ask for the title um, and the name of the author. So that's what the, the sparse field sets are all about. Um, uh, and then finally, um, it, uh, uh, it has, um, it, it's, uh, JSON API itself specifies how you can, um, uh, how you can include filtering but it doesn't specify how you do the filtering. Um, and there are a couple of different approaches that you can use. Um, this is an example from Drupal. Um, and so instead of getting all the articles and then having to parse through them on the front end to find the ones that um, uh, match the field name, uh, you can do that in your request. Um, so this is like, it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty robust tool and it has a lot of uh, like options and, and opportunities. Um, but as you can see even from these examples, um, you start getting to very, very long URLs. Um, uh, and there's a hard limit that you can hit um, in the length of a URL. We like know this because we've hit it. Um, so GraphQL. GraphQL is kind of the same, but very different. Um, it's kind of the same in that it's the interface for, um, uh, for an API. Um, so it's a query language for APIs, but it's also a runtime for filling, for filling those queries with your existing data. GraphQL provides a complete and understandable um, description of the, the data in your API, gives clients the, the power to ask um, for exactly what they need and nothing more, and makes it easy to evolve APIs over time um, and enables powerful developer tools. Um, that's what it says, like on the first paragraph of the uh, GraphQL website, and I, I thought it was a really good first paragraph. It really hits all the points of what's in, like what's important. Um, this little animation, again, directly from their uh, homepage, um, is exactly what GraphQL looks like um, when you're using it. Um, and uh, not, not just from a, uh, like this isn't like even really an abstraction, like this is really what it looks like to, uh, to interface with it. Um, so first of all, it's, a, um, uh, it's an interactive tool um, and there are like uh, different competing interactive tools like this um, to sort of construct your queries. The other thing that's really important to sort of see about this um, and sort of in a compare and contrast between JSON API and, and, and GraphQL is that your request is shaped very similarly to your response that you get back. So, and each, um, each attribute that, you're, that you ask for in a, um, uh, in a GraphQL uh, uh, request um, has to be specifically um, uh, enumerated. So you, there, there is no, uh, it, and it looks kind of like SQL, um, but it doesn't have a star operator. Like you can't just ask for, give me everything about heroes. 
Um, and that's going to become important a little bit later, and is really like a part of its, its, its fun, kind of fundamental to its design philosophy. So, I said this a couple times. It's worth putting it up in a slide, though. So, it creates a query format to make requests, and the runtime for fulfilling those requests with your existing data. So, it's not just a specification that, that, that's outward facing. It's also a spe specification that's inward facing in how you're going to interact with it. Um, and that's going to come up later, too. So, because um, I'm sure there's one person here that just like saw the thing on the, uh, on the list and thought this. It's like, well, th those aren't two things you should be comparing, because it's like comparing apples to oranges. And I'll take it even further, and I'll say it's like comparing apples to orange juice. Um, it's like they're two very, like, very different, like, very, they, they, uh, exist in a separate space, take up a different set of, uh, 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 of constraints. Um, and, uh, but really when it comes down to it, like these are probably the two things that you're kind of choosing if you're thinking about creating an API. So that's what they have in common. Like, yes, absolutely. It is like comparing apples to, to, to oranges. Um, but it's still the choice that you're probably gonna make. So uh, now probably the exciting part is uh, kind of what we built. Um, so what we started with was a really humble Drupal 7 site. Um, and in its first original iteration, uh, it, didn't even, uh, it didn't even use JSON API. Um, it was just a, uh, 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 it was a, um, Basically, it was basically HAL, but not really even really HAL, um, which is another um, API um, specification. Um, and uh, it really grew from there uh, into the infrastructure that really powers everything. Um, and I'm going to go over kind of the different. Um, there we go. So, again, terabits of data in the data store. Um, and that's metadata about all the content. You'd be surprised at how much days of their lives there is. Um, so there's tens of millions of requests weekly to the API. Um, and again, uh, we've been able to achieve sub, um, uh, uh, sub half second, sub 500 millisecond personalized uh, content response times. The reason that I put the word personalized in this every time I mention it um, is because um, uh, I would hope that your unpersonalized um, content um, responses from your API um, are much faster than that um, uh, because they should be cached, right? Um, and hopefully even cached at the edge. So um, again, started as REST-ish and then moved to JSON API. Um, it was the genesis um, for, the, for the RESTful module in Drupal 7, if you kind of remember that. Um, and um, as we started to add new, sh uh, uh, new content to it, so new shows, it really started up for one show, um, ran, started running into the type of scaling issues that you would expect from a Drupal site that's starting to um, uh, uh, run at scale. So um, we um, put a, a Node.js proxy in front of it, um, and at first it was just a proxy, um, and just um, uh, 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 was just like basically a firewall for it. Um, then um, added a permanent uh, external data store. So instead of just cache caching the uh, proxy data in um, Redis, um, added it to a permanent uh, document data store. Um, and then we started to bypass Drupal when right directly to that document store. Um, one of the things that we struggled with um, was um, uh, keeping the, the data model um, and the API in sync. Um, because uh, in, in Drupal, it's not something you really hit um, because your, um, uh, your API is kind of is, is self-generated by changes you make in the, uh, in the data model interface and that kind of stuff, or I guess in Drupal 8 with like your YAML files or whatever. Um, but when those two are separated, um, you start running, uh, start running into problems of kind of keeping those things in, in sync. Um, and then also um, struggled with clients starting uh, um, uh, needing different things in their in the data model um, and then also clients starting to kind of screw up in their screw up their responses 
and the weight that they're using the API. Um, and so we um, built a bunch of stuff to, to make it work better. Um, so we re-architected the data model to be um, more normalized and um, uh, 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 and more abstracted. Um, we changed the data store uh, from a document um, database uh, to a graph database, um, which is a whole other topic to talk about and something that is um, really cool uh, and really makes a lot of sense for um, yeah, for a lot of the problems we're solving in Drupal. Um, and um, to, uh, to make our own lives easier um, and to be able to create these, um, uh, uh, this, this architecture, uh, we ended up creating a number of open source tools um, uh, and packages for Node.js um, to make this stuff happen. Um, so uh, one of them is Schemepunk, um, and that uh, deals with um, uh, how schemas are uh, created and how um, uh, those schemas uh, relate to JSON API endpoints. Um, uh, Semberist, which um, is a, um, uh, it's a tool used to manage semantic versioning for APIs, um, which uh, was important because we had clients who um, uh, wanted to both, uh, we, had, we, had, we had different clients who either wanted to make sure that their API was not changing ever and that they could um, uh, absolutely be, be sure that their responses were always consistent. Uh, but then as uh, we were adding new things to the API, um, uh, we had other clients who wanted to be able to take advantage of those new fields, new attributes that we were adding to um, our, our data objects. Um, and so we basically created semantic versioning for, for APIs. Does, anybody not, does semantic versioning not make sense to anybody? Maybe a little bit. Okay, so semantic versioning. So semantic versioning, it's a, um, uh, it, it's, it's a very specific way in how you version things. Um, and each, um, uh, uh, like 1.0.0, um, each, one um, uh, each one of those places um, has a very specific meaning. Um, and it has to do with um, uh, the uh, updatability and, and things like that. So like how much you can rely on it. So if it's on the, like, the third O, um, means that it's just a, a minor update and shouldn't have any um, uh, uh, changes to the API. Uh, minor would uh, be non-breaking changes to the API, and then you have to like um, uh, churn the, the, the top one if you're actually adding kind of new features or changing features, so breaking changes. Um, there were a couple other tools that we were built, um, but this became uh, somewhat, of a, um, somewhat a, a, of a complicated beast. Um, and uh, so then we um, uh, were adding new shows, um, adding new content, uh, new types of content, um, adding new stations, um, and um, we're also adding new clients. Um, and there was a request from uh, the, the business team to move a lot of the logic um, about how those APIs or, or like how those clients are consuming the API from the client teams. Uh, because uh, imagine this ecosystem that um, it's not just a front end team and a back end team. Um, there's seven to 10 front end teams working in uh, a dozen different languages and technologies. Um, all consuming this API. So when the business said, well, we want to change the way that the home page image uh, uh, looks and uh, what fields are on that, that, um, uh, that big hero image, um, they would have to make sure that each one of those teams implemented that, um, uh, that the, those business rules correctly. So they really wanted to take that away from, the, uh, from all those, from those 10 different teams and move it into um, uh, this one, uh, one place. Um, so uh, it um, started with home pages, uh, but then grew, grew to um, uh, encompass all the different UI experiences um, that were, um, uh, uh, that were in, in the apps. Um, it, uh, uh, it used Apollo's server, um, not the hosted servers, but the framework. Um, use graph uh, QL tools for constructing, constructing the, the, the schema. 
the playground IDE for uh, constructing the queries, Voyager for the schema uh, um, visualizer, um, uh, the data loader for loading the data, um, and all these tools were s things that we could take advantage of and didn't require for uh, the internal development or for us to create open source tools, which in a way is disappointing, um, but as far as like speed and agility, um, was not disappointing. Um, so uh, today, both of these tools, um, uh, both of these APIs are in production. Um, the JSON API API um, is mostly inward facing um, and something that's used internally and doesn't hit, uh, and clients generally don't hit it. Um, although they are still um, writing all of their um, uh, analytics to it directly. Um, GraphQL is handling all the different uh, UI elements. Um, and um, one, of the, like, one of the other changes that we made around this time um, was that we went from a, um, uh, uh, a, a, um, a data model that included the things you would are, are traditionally in a data model like um, users, um, uh, shows, entities, etc., um, and moved to a component-based um, API. And what what that meant is that instead of requesting um, the videos for the home page, you would request a home page, um, and then the home page in its data object would have um, uh, the different sections and each section would have its own format. Um, if you want to find out more about that, um, Luke is actually giving a talk specifically about that. Um, and that's one of the, like, it's, it, it adds to the apples, apples to oranges sort of comparison because it's, it was, was one big fundamental change um, uh, added to another. Um, but then also this was, um, uh, it, it turned out to be one of the biggest uh, kind of wins. So talk about that in a bit. So, um, so yeah. So let's let let's let's talk about like how these two things compared. Um, so we used both of them very early in their life cycles. Um, we weren't quite as um, uh, uh, quite as early with um, uh, with GraphQL as we were with JSON API. Um, JSON API had definitely not reached 1.0 when we started using it, um, and then I think GraphQL hadn't either. Uh, but it was a lot closer. Um, honestly, at the scale that we're that we're working at, um, very little scalability issues um, were related to the edge or the um, API architecture, um, and the caching was very different uh, for both uh, API approaches. Uh, but both of them required multi-layered um, caching at the at the edge, application, and, and and database layer to meet the demands of the um, uh, of the volume of uh, of work that we were doing. Um, oddly enough, like one of the things that really uh, uh, that we ran into um, was that um, uh, the GraphQL database, uh, the GraphQL was built, um, the GraphQL API uh, was built on lambdas. Um, and ran into lots of undocumented problems with lambdas at scale. Um, so including um, strange memory limits, um, problems with cold starts and how they're different than um, uh, uh, when the, like the, the, the underlying infrastructure for the lambdas was already running. Um, and then just generally, like with, I'm sure that anybody who's worked with AWS, just undocumented features. Um, so this scalability issue, um, and, and how they were uh, like very much, uh, very much the same, um, probably doesn't necess doesn't necessarily apply in all cases. Um, but at this scale, at tens of millions of requests per you know per week per day, um, you're like the um, uh, it, yeah it like those the problems become bigger than just you know which API architecture. Um, that may not be true for for smaller sites. Um, so let's let, let's talk about what, what's different about them. Um, universally, um, and I uh, and, and this is something that the, that um, I saw, heard, and uh, and happened all the time was that um, JSON API was significantly harder for clients to use. Um, 
On the other hand, GraphQL was very quick uh, for clients to adopt. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we made a very big architectural change to how the uh, uh, API is shaped, what kind of data model they would be working with, and what, um, what their responsibilities were when we implemented GraphQL. Um, and uh, it actually smoothed that transition that, um, that they were no longer having to figure out um, sort of the intricacies of making requests to, to JSON uh, API in a performing way. Um, scalability in, uh, in, in JSON API um, was um, heavily leveraged, uh, allowed us to heavily leverage uh, the advantages of HTTP. Um, on the other hand, um, scalability in, um, in GraphQL required um, clients to make uh, subtle changes to the way they make requests um, which really caused some of the clients to have problems. Um, one, of the, um, one of the selling points of JSON API um, is that, uh, and, and one of the ways that they, they talk about themselves, or that uh, is that they that it's a anti bike shedding for um, for how you specify your responses, and that's absolutely true. It's a great specification. However, ran into uh, a lot of bike shedding um, and uh, hand wringing uh, about how um, the data model related to um, and was expressed in the API. Um, and how that related to the data model and how it was stored. Um, on the other hand, um, the general workflow, and, and the gentleman that was here before me kind of talked a little bit about it and was like sort of a downside from his perspective, um, but um, uh, in um, uh, uh, an upside for us um, was that um, there was a very, uh, very standardized and streamlined way uh, for how to get data into the edge um, and the built-in type system within um, GraphQL really um, uh, sped up development times. Um, so everything needs to be very specific um, and, uh, and outlined in, um, uh, individually, um, but the way that you um, specify and outline those things is very standardized. So you lose one person nodding their head, so good. Um, and then, um, so uh, as I mentioned, there was this big change from a um, entity-based API into a component-based API. Um, separating the edge um, and the data store had some unexpected benefits. One of them was for scalability. Um, so one of the things that um, uh, you should be concerned with, um, but is also kind of a bit of a a bit of a FUD around GraphQL um, is that um, you um, uh, it, the, the performance and scalability is unpredictable uh, because you're giving your clients the ability to request any kind of anything from your database. Um, and so, like, if anybody's written a bad views query, um, you can kind of know how like how how quickly that can go south. Um, because we were controlling that and also separating, um, we were already doing transformations and doing requests um, uh, to our internal APIs. Um, that forced um, uh, a layer of cacheability um, and a layer of, of, uh, of forethought uh, before we were um, uh, allowing our clients to, uh, to access the API. Um, so that, that actually kind of solved for itself uh, one of the biggest drawbacks or potential drawbacks uh, um, uh, of GraphQL. Um, because we already had to sort of like transform and then cache um, our requests to our, to our data store. Um, uh, no longer really had to like worry about like, well, like if people make a weird um, GraphQL query, like is that going to um, uh, uh, have knock-on effects um, to the, uh, like uh, slow down the query, make slow queries to the database. Um, Moving the business logic from all those individual client teams um, to a single point of success on the API um, was uh, uh, a brilliant move <laughs> um, and really is something that should be kind of considered. Um, and uh, we're all here like looking at like how to build uh, decoupled sites. Um, and um, I, I wanna sort of like challenge people to think about it as two different things, like one, you're either building an application 
in which case like your front end is doing lots of manipulations to the to the back end um, and in which case having a lot of business logic in the front end makes a lot makes sense however if it's just a presentational API and it's just um, a, a way of powering UI elements it probably makes sense to instead of exposing your entities to expose components as data um, Luke's going to give a full hour, 45 minutes, or however long this talk's supposed to be, about that. Um, and I uh, highly recommend everybody to take a look at it. Um, it was uh, a game changer and kind of like has changed the way that we're thinking about um, building decoupled sites. Um, but it, um, uh, upon hearing it and seeing it, uh, um, uh, I think everybody has a visceral reaction of like, well, that's not right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, not what that, like, that's not what the API should look like. Um, but when you think about it in terms of are you building an, a UI um, or are you building an application, um, there's, a, there's a divergence there. And yeah, you might think about something completely crazy like exposing your homepage as an API endpoint. Okay. So, the like, big question like, which one should you use? Um, so if you're building a content API, so not if you're building a backend for applications or not if you're building an, uh, uh, a, um, uh, uh, a microservices architecture, um, you should use GraphQL. Um, uh, like unanimously and kind of like in, uh, 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 both from a strategic perspective, like kind of from my perspective, um, and then from an on, on the ground developer perspective. Um, GraphQL was a clear winner in sort of in um, in, in what it brought to the table, um, and had um, much less impactful downsides. Um, so I don't know. Here's, here's my marketing thing. It, it, it's fast. Uh, so GraphQL, it's fast, fast, easy, and robust. Um, so it's fast to get started and requires um, little phil philosophical and um, uh, and deeper knowledge. Um, on the other hand. REST um, and, and JSON API requires that both the client teams and the um, server teams um, have a very good understanding of REST and the principles and, 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 and how it's applied, uh, a very good understanding of the specification and at times very esoteric um, and uh, uh, very well documented but very, um, uh, very pedantically documented uh, uh, um, types of interactions. Um, it's very fast for backend teams to implement. Um, so uh, uh, JSON API stops at a specification and there's very little tooling around it. Um, that's kind of different if you're building a Drupal site because it comes with JSON API. Um, but uh, it, it's even, even within Drupal, adding new things to the JSON API sometimes be a little difficult. Um, and it's very easy for front end teams to, to, to use. Um, because there are, um, uh, there are uh, uh, a large number of, uh, of front-end tools available um, and there are lots of interactive tools for interacting with this queryable database. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's something that people kind of immediately get because you can kind of poke at it and play with it and get what you need and you don't have to really understand it. Um, and then it's really, it's, it's, it's really robust um, and one of the biggest benefits, um, is I mentioned before, um, that it's like, like SQL without the star operator. Emitting that star operator makes it so that you can make changes to your data model without impacting clients because they're requesting exactly what they need. They're not iterating over large objects that have everything. Um, and that really, um, uh, that really changes things. So like if you want to add, uh, uh, a picture to an author, it, any client that hasn't, doesn't want a picture um, and has already been requesting the author never sees that that picture has been added because they're asking specifically for which fields they need. Um, and that's the best way I can explain that. <laughs> and it feels like I'm not getting through to everybody, but it's a true superpower. Um, and once you kind of wrap your head around why that works, um, it, uh, it completely eliminates a lot of the difficulties that you have with a REST API and versioning, um, which 
can be one of the most painful things. And then in any, like JSON API or any other spec, it's usually not defined really clearly on how you should version your API. So uh, it, you know, while JSON API is, is sort of an anti-bike shedding tool um, for the uh, responses, it's kind of like REST in itself is a giant sort of bike shedding tool <laughs> um, for like how you construct your APIs. Um, so there are a couple caveats. Um, uh, like it, it's flexible in weird ways, and it's also um, uh, immature in weird ways. Uh, that can be minefields. So pagination is one of them. Uh, cacheability. Um, uh, uh, you, you can't take advantage of like a lot of the HTTP cache, uh, uh, caching, which means that a lot of edge caching isn't possible. Um, uh, scalability is kind of scary. I mean, um, uh, because you don't um, you don't know what kind of requests you're going to get theoretically, so you could potentially have performance problems that you that are un unanticipated. Um, but then also like really hard to anticipate because you're creating this sort of, like you're creating this this query language, um, and then uh, that makes like the like caching would be hard to plan for, um, and it happens at a different place. Um, and JSON API is clearly better sometimes, and so here are a couple of those cases. Um, so one of the things that the, the JSON API it, like um, uh, really excels. Um, is if you have an ecosystem um, where there are multiple APIs um, that are interacting with each other. Um, that doesn't mean, uh, so in GraphQL, everything has to come through kind of a single point, um, and there's no concept of links uh, and things like that. Um, if you're building a microservices architecture, if you're using Lambdas, you're not building a microservices architecture. Um, and uh, you kind of have to like take my word for this, um, or like look up what Martin Fowler. I forgot to add a link to this, but like look up what Martin Fowler like ta how he talks about microservices architecture and why they're probably a bad idea. Um, but uh, like long story short, unless you're a giant enterprise, um, and unless you have multiple teams that are working on multiple very independent projects, the microservices architecture is probably not right for you. Um, It's the right choice if you have high scalability demands, uh, but limited ability or resources to, to vote to scalability. Um, and that actually kind of plays into another thing, is that it, it is actually the right, really the right choice for Drupal to ship with. Um, because uh, uh, while it's, uh, JSON API can be harder for clients to interact with, um, it's also harder for server teams or people hosting um, a site to screw up completely. Um, and that's like, a, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, and then like some of the caveats about this. Um, so if it's done right, REST and JSON API um, becomes infinitely scalable um, in almost every sense of the word. Um, rock solid and can benefit from the principles that make the world our build so, so successful. However, because it's based on REST, it's very, very easy to get wrong. And getting it wrong creates tons of headaches for everyone involved. Um, and so the um, the best case scenario is probably better. Like honestly, sure. Um, but that like uh, um, the 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 more people have worked with REST, the less they think that it's yeah, the less they say that they understand it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, and uh, and it's, um, it, it is genuinely very hard for clients to, to get on board um, and requires that they have a good knowledge of the principles behind how things are built as opposed to just being able to sort of bang their heads against the keyboard and like get data back. Um, and it really requires constant discipline from everyone involved um, to, to, to make things work well um, even with good versioning, um, changes to the API can produce very uh, uh, can very easily produce breaking changes to to the API, uh, to the to the clients, um, and it's 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 actually hard to avoid in REST. Whereas in GraphQL, it's sort of hard to be able to hit those places where breaking changes affect clients. Um, so here are a couple links. So you want to read up on REST. There's, that's where to get started. <laughs>
Um, uh, REST uh, versus GraphQL is a crit critical look. Um, this is a talk, and linked in the talk is a um, uh, uh, is a blog post, and it's actually it's excellent and kind of talks about it in a, in a more abstract way than I am, uh, and is really worth diving into if you're making architectural choices about which API paradigm to use. Um, and then here is a wonderful article about what's so great about JSON API. Questions? Yes, I believe you said um, one of the caveats of GraphQL was the pagination. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could just expand on that a little bit more. What you mean by that? <clears throat> is it difficult to do with GraphQL, or is it... there's just there's, there's like like different ways to do it, and it's you're it's, you're you're kind of on your own. So like there 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 isn't like a, there isn't a built-in pagination scheme, um, and so like you like you can take different approaches, and it's one place where you kind of need to figure out if you need a cursor-based or page-based, like um, yeah. Yeah. So the, in the implementations that you have worked on, are you using the Drupal GraphQL module, or you have some like a, a node server running in the middle? That okay, because otherwise you're kind of stuck with the schema that that the module provides you, or you have to create your own schemas, and and then you you kind of lose out on the cross-platform stuff. So I was wondering how you implemented that. Yeah, it's a completely separate server. Yeah. Um, and in this architecture that we like that, that we used, um, it was completely divorced from the um, data stores data model, um, and that turned out to be a really big benefit. Um, yeah, because you're otherwise you're stuck with what the entity system gives you. Yes. And if you ever like onboarded like a front end team that has never worked with Drupal to start using Drupal JSON, it there it's very confusing. So then is that, that node server that you're doing GraphQL with talking to Drupal? Yes. And it's doing and it's actually, it's actually Well, it's, so it's talking to a completely separate um, API. Um, Drupal just feeds into, this, uh, into the data store, um, mm -hmm. and the, um, the, the GraphQL stuff is actually talking to the JSON API stuff. I have another one. Sure. Yeah. I think the component-based uh, model is really interesting, but I thought with the couple that was like you were separating your content from presentation, and it feels like those two things are coming back together. And I'm wondering if I'm. No, you're you're not. It, it it is like a complete breaking of that like like I don't know one of those paradigms about like what's like what's good about like good API design. Um, but um, I it, it, I think like I don't know. There, there's like best practices and there's things that people say that like you should do this. Um, and then you like then there's the right approach, which is like really understanding what your problem is and finding the right solution to, to fit that problem. And understanding the, the, the problem is kind of where the difference between an application um, and a UI layer lie. Um, and so like one of the like I don't know one, one way to, to think about it. So if you're just exposing your entities and it's very pure and it really reflects the um, uh, the the way that your data is stored in the database. Um, that means that no matter what, there's a lot of business logic that ends up in the front end. And if you're trying to make a performant content consumption API, why are you putting that, um, that business logic in uh, JavaScript files that need to be downloaded by people on uh, like uh, terrible conference Wi-Fi? Um, so instead of just putting all that business logic on the, uh, uh, on the server and then serving an API that is specifically built um, for the UI. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm Starting to, maybe. maybe. Yeah. Um, it, it is probably like one of the weirdest, like weirder concepts, um, but, uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it does absolutely fly in the face of these best practices. Um, but I think that the best practice, while it's right um, globally, like if you're kind of looking at like, What's the what's what's a good what, what's a good way to do, do things? And it's like decoupling and and, and separation of concerns. Um, but is like if you're just building a UI layer, it probably makes sense to maybe not. Um, think of it another way to look at it that I just kind of thought of um, uh, is uh, tell everybody not to put any logic in the template files. 
But when we're building a decoupled front end, we tell everybody to put all their business logic in the template files. Right? Doesn't make any sense anymore. Um, and that's really what the difference is. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I had a question about, um, you talked about how you were having issues with, uh, with caching, I think it was, um, regarding just arbitrary GraphQL queries. You weren't sure exactly what you were gonna get, so it was having some- It's there. unpredictable. Unpredictable, okay. It's for scaling. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, did you look at uh, persistent queries? And is that something that- Yeah, that's, sorry. Like, why, I, I, why wasn't it useful for that problem? Uh, it, it is useful. Okay. That was the thing when I mentioned that like the, the front end teams were like, what am I supposed to like? Like, I don't like this, I don't want to do it. Like, that was the thing. Um, and it was persistent queries. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's like, I think it's a battle worth fighting. <laughs> um, and because it is like kind of desperately easy. Um, and I didn't like, mention persistent queries specifically because I didn't want to kind of have to ex explain it. But fair, fair enough. You just need some automation there so that they don't have to think about it and it gets done anyway. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think there's more opportunities on um, sort of uh, figuring out better ways or, or better best practices around uh, avoiding that problem entirely um, and kind of uh, doing that at the edge or finding ways to do that at, at the edge. Um, or the GraphQL changes some ways that it works. Or maybe we change get so it can have a body. <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that was kind of my follow-up question. Like, how do you um, it depends. Um, and you can do the edge caching with um, with HTTP, like you, you kind of can, and it's, it's not, um, uh, I, I think like one of the things that, that uh, uh, was convincing the ops team that they could cache post requests. <laughs> Um, and uh, and then also convincing the software, like the caching software, that you could do that. And then some of the CDNs, they're starting to also um, uh, solve that problem as well. well. Persistent queries would help with that as well, wouldn't it? It absolutely does. But it's like it's one it's it's like one little step, and yeah, I, I agree, it should be completely automated, like within the SDK, and that kind of like solves the problem as well. Um, but kind of back on the diatribe that I am about moving business logic from the uh, from the edge or from the clients like into the server, like having to not have to deal with persistent queries would in my like future looking would be the ideal. That makes sense? Yeah. Do you think maybe you, you could describe what persistent queries does as far as Yeah. So it doesn't just post it, it does get instead and Exactly. So so like the the way that persistent queries work um, is that uh, so the way that um, uh, everything in GraphQL um, is a post request. Um, so it needs a body. Um, and um, uh, so there's a there's a way to do persistent queries, which is an add-on to GraphQL um, uh, that is actually really commonly used, but it's like not part of it. Um, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to make a request, um, and in that request you get back like how like how would you request this again um, as a get request. So you just get back a hash, and then so on your um, follow-up queries, you, you'd only request that hash. And there's like time to live with it, with it and that kind of stuff that you have to kind of dance, dance through, but it's not a big deal. Can't you define like aliases to say like if you just want this short version, this is the way you do it. Yeah, and, and you can also kind of fully bake those and then like just tell the client just use this URL. <laughs> Um, and and that's that's another technique that we ended up using as well. So, yes, um, it, it, it's not a it's not a big hurdle, and it, persistent queries are great. Absolutely use persistent persistent queries. No argument with persistent queries. But um, it'd be better if they didn't have to exist. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So persistent queries, interestingly, we felt the lines in the server. Say that again? So I'm saying that the, just an observation about the thing that you were talking about before. Persistent queries are wrong to be coupled with clients to the server because the client needs to know the hash or name of the query. So that's a funny side effect of things. 
Um, yeah, a, a lot of GraphQL kind of couples. Right. There's a lot of coupling there, and not 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 in bad ways. <laughs> yeah. um, we we are decoupled decoupled days, but there's good coupling and there's bad coupling. Right. Um, I have one question for you because I think I have not heard anything mentioned about rights. Is it possible that you I heard you mention content consumption API specifically. So is it possible that your like uh, your your analysis is primarily based on the content consumption being read only API? Yes. Um, and actually, I um, remembered to add that as a caveat at some point, um, at least three different times. I just never actually mentioned it. So thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, no worries. Um, I was just trying to make sure. And, and actually, in the architecture, it's, um, uh, all the writes that are done by the clients are actually done back to the um, original uh, uh, JSON API. Um, and really, that's more of a where we are in the evolution of the, of the product, not necessarily in an architectural choice.